So Dave is a professional land surveyor licensed in California and Nevada and primarily practices in the Los Angeles Basin. He is recognized in both the state and federal courts as an expert in land surveying. So without further ado, we appreciate Mr. Dave joining us tonight on Mentoring Mondays. Thanks a lot, Trent. I appreciate it and uh, welcome yeah. everybody that took the time out of their data to, to be here today and I appreciate it. And what today's topic is, is standard of care for boundary surveyors. And everybody thinks in terms of liability, typically in the construction sense and the boundary sense, uh, less so. But something that is interesting to me anyway is, is uh, years ago when we totaled up all the amount of claims paid in land surveying, we were over 3.5 million. And currently, like, on my plate, I have another million and a half sitting out there. So, you know, we're over $5 million where surveyors or their insurance companies have paid these claims. And when I, the reason I, I am a witness to this is I, I serve as an expert witness on, uh, for, in, in, for the courts, both uh, state and federal. And a lot of times it, it's in land surveyor negligence cases. And so land surveyor negligence going to trial or going to the deposition first and then to the trial, typically in my experience are in the boundary cases. Almost all of those $5 million that I mentioned is boundary cases. And the reason being is that in construction surveying, you're working in real time. So if something's wrong, everybody knows it right away and there has to be a remedy to fix it. You have sophisticated parties in that you have a, a land surveyor, maybe an engineer, and in a contractor. And this project needs to move forward. Uh, they're very quick to figure out who did what. And most of them get settled uh, in, in these cases, they, they get settled. The only time they don't, sit, well, I can't say the only time, but the, they usually settle. Boundary cases are, are different in that case, uh, in, in, in many cases. And the reason is, is they're not easily settled because you have uh, sometimes sophisticated, sometimes unsophisticated parties but you're dealing with a property line that would require a remedy that requires a third party, a, a neighbor, for instance, or requires a, a situation. And these are oftentimes emotional cases. They get involved. Uh, sometimes they have title insurance that covers, sometimes they don't, but they get vested in these arguments and they're off to the races. And so these large dollar claims that I'm talking about come from boundaries that don't get resolved and then they end up going to court or they end up getting so deep into it that they resolve it very close to the trial date. And so there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of ins and outs on it. So people say, well, as a boundary surveyor, what can you do to better protect yourself to understand the standard of care? And how, how can you resolve these situations and keep yourself out of harm's way and serve the public? And so I'm going to go to the slideshow now. Here we go. And standard of care for land surveyors. And this is this is what it looks like. This was actually a lawsuit. Uh, you'll see the fence there. You're looking down, and you see the hub there that's shown uh, in orange. And they were saying that that fence that you see towards the top of the photograph was encroaching by, if you look at the fence post next to it, it's a little more than half a foot. And they had staked this out with a RTK unit and said, here's the corner. And then they had the attorneys out and they had, had me come out. And I didn't even set up an instrument. I just took a shovel and started digging around that post. And there's the original pipe. Still had flagging. They were so close and yet so far. Well, by this point, they were pretty well into the process if I was out there. And that's a typical case of negligence. Found original pipe, fits the fence, which you, there was a wall, there was other things as you go on, but the surveyors didn't actually find that pipe. They based their measurements and whatever they did on a, a location that was clearly not in the right place. They created an encroachment that it didn't actually exist. That's this, typically how these cases go. Everybody thinks that it's, oh, I've read Brown and I know all this case law and, and these kind of things. And that's, you know, I'm, I'm a very smart, educated surveyor. And so, 
you know, I, I know how to resolve these boundaries. Well, most of the boundaries that fail actually fail in this regard. Um, usually there's a found original monument or a perpetuation of in the ground that the surveyor didn't find. And that by definition would be negligence. Negligence, and I'll, I'll, I'll step you through the slides. I don't wanna get ahead of myself here. Let's, uh, so reasonable man doctrine, if you wanna do some research or standard of care, let's, what are we actually talking about when we talk about a standard of care? And the standard of care, I won't read it to you. It's what would a, a competent land surveyor in our industry do under similar or the same circumstances in a similar situation. Now the standard is not perfection. And how does this, why does it matter? Why do we talk about standard of care? Well, the standard of care, if you get charged with negligence or professional malpractice, but it's negligence, professional negligence. It means that you breached the standard of care. You didn't do what an ordinarily licensed professional, competent professional would have done. Now, would an ordinary licensed professional find the original monuments? Yeah, if they're on the surface. Yes, if they're deep down a foot. Probably not if they're down eight feet because would somebody dig eight feet? Would they not? Would they, was, was it recoverable? Now, if you say search found nothing and I get a backhoe and I dig down eight feet and I find a monument that you said wasn't there, were you negligent? No, because the standard isn't, nobody digs down eight feet except for maybe me that day. That doesn't prove negligence. But if I can do like in that first picture, if I can just go out with a shovel, no instrument, and dig around that post, not even knowing if it was there or not, and find the monument, that, that's a case of, of negligence. So we're going to talk about, there's several different types of negligence, and I'm going to kind of go into those. Uh, you're getting short, shorted a little bit because I used to teach a class that was like 12 weeks on ethics and standard of care for land surveyors, and you're going to get about an hour and a half of a 12-week course. <laughs> so, so I'm going to be jumping around, but I would welcome an opportunity to come back and take some deep dives on any one of these issues. This is going to be the 30,000 foot. We'll talk about it, these things, but I would actually be willing to sit down and go through some actual cases and the dollar amounts that these surveyors paid. So uh, we'll start here. One of the issues that we have Oh, I went the wrong way. Oh, duplicate slide, let's see. Oh, here you go. No, this isn't. So if you work in an area that all the surveyors are not very good, meaning you guys all do the same crappy kind of surveys, that does not satisfy the locale or what other surveyors in that jurisdiction would do. Uh, we have areas that our licensing board in California refers to as regional incompetence. So we have little pockets of surveyors that don't do well uh, within their area. So does that make it the standard of care? No, it does not. And even when you start talking about regional incompetence, that doesn't, again, doesn't make the standard of care. And that, that, that came out in the case of Wyoming. And so where this comes up a lot of times is, is you'll hear a surveyor say something like, uh, you know, if I did, did if I had a surveyor tell me, if I followed the law and did everything correctly, I wouldn't have any work. Well, that's, that's unfortunate because you and I were have you and I being the surveyor and I were having that, that conversation and that's not a very good defense. <laughs> so you, you're, that's, that's just something to think about because if your local areas, everybody takes two two monuments, rotates a deed record boundary, they call it, and we're we'll talk about that a little bit later, uh, and they they call it an ALTA. That actually isn't the standard of care. So, what is the role of the surveyor? Well, this boundary surveyor is liable for the damages resulting directly from the facts not in agreement with the certifications, and the surveyor may be liable for the failure to do what an ordinary prudent surveyor would do under the same or similar circumstances. This is important because if you're certifying to something, you had 
you should have something in your file that proves you actually did it. I'll give an example, uh, in ALTA, just because that's a standard that's written, and it says it's uh, plus or minus seven hundredths at 95% with 50 parts per million. So you, you write that, let's say the boundary comes into question, and the first question would be is, did you meet that standard, and how did you, how did you check it? How did you prove it? Well, if you say, well, I dialed up on the local RTN system to a base station, you know, 45 kilometers away. So I figure I'm that good. Well, immediately you're not you, you, because that, that RTN system wouldn't meet those accuracies. And so you have no way of proving that you met those accuracies in that particular scenario. I just made that up. And so if you certified to something and you don't do it, you're in trouble right away. So when you're surveying to a standard, you need to have a method of determining a standard, documenting that you met that standard and putting it in the file. When I was doing a little bit of research for this program, and we'll go through it. Nevada has a lot of uh, statutes that are actually dictate the standards of practice within Nevada. California does not have the, this, the, the equal or the same. And so it's really easy in Nevada to figure out uh, if you met a standard or if you didn't meet a standard. And I'm gonna talk about those a little bit later also. So again, the failure to meet this standard is, and go ahead and read it, I won't read it to you. And what it says is, is, how do you determine if you met the standard or not? Well, that's where in the role that I, I serve is uh, you have an expert come in and the expert testifies to the process and the procedures and the standards. And then the trier of fact determines whether or not uh, my testimony would be credible and whether or not the standards hold up on their own. Now, an example of a standard would be the ALTA standards. The, there's a standard for most everything. Uh, that we do. And in the absence of a standard, then you're going to testify. It, it gets a little shaky at that point. And so if you're doing work and you don't have a standard, you should put a standard in place. And that's one of the preventative things you're going to do. But it requires expert testimony. So you say, if I, if I get one of the surveyors down the street and we're all equally competent and they were to look into my file and see what I did, would that, would that with hold water? And that's basically a, a rough litmus test of where you are. Now, here's something to think about. I, I've been licensed for you know, 25, 30 years. Now, if you just got licensed last week, we're on the same, you're held to the same standard. And, and you can say, well, you know, uh, Dave, you've served on all these cases and you've had 30 years to acquire this experience. And that's, that's actually true but your brand new license is held to the same standard. They don't have any training wheels to kick off. And so keep that in mind. How do you, how do you do to a surveyor that may have many more years experience or to a surveyor that has a specialty in the work that you're trying to do? Because a lot of surveyors, what they'll do is they kind of, uh, we, we tend to have this jack of all trades uh, mentality because we do have some wide ranging skills but the surveyor's default a lot of times is how hard can it be? I, I've, I've, I'll see a surveyor out working and, and I, one, one, one particular one that I remember, it was a very difficult job and I don't know how I became aware of it if I was driving by, if I had lost the opportunity to do the job myself and I saw a surveyor working out there. and I, I stopped and I said, hey, uh, what do you got going on here? And uh, so he tells me, I said, you know, have you ever done anything like this? And he's like, no, and I'm like, there is so much liability in what you're doing right now. Can I just offer you a little bit of advice on this? And he's like, well, I just kind of figured how else am I going to learn and how hard can it be? And I thought, my gosh, it's just walking on the edge of a cliff with a bottle of booze in your hand. It's, it's the, but the, you don't know what you don't know and the, the awareness. So when you start venturing out and, and we all have to, the California law allows you to try new technology and try some of these things, but I, I have a couple of things that I do to minimize my potential negligence. When I'm working outside of my region, uh, a lot of times I'll hire a reputable survey company in that region to, to 
tell me what's going on in the area as far as uh, particular types of monuments or whatever. And then I have them QA, QC all my work. Then, then I'm sure to understand that I'm not gonna miss something in their local practice. I also, it's very, it's very smart to do that in that I'm, I don't need to haul up pipe, 25 foot rods, a lot of things that are hard to do a job correctly when you're traveling. So when I fly into Humboldt, which is clear on the other side of the state, we hire a local firm, we get some equipment from them, we take them out to the job site, walk them through what we did. And then if there's some pickup work or something later, and this is all boundary type work, then I have a local firm that knows all my control, checked everything, and that's how I stay out of trouble is, is in the local area. Now, why would I be working up there? Well, that particular client, it was a lawsuit and it was the, uh, the federal government had hired me. And so when you're doing public land surveys, it's public land surveys. However, there are nuances to everywhere you go. And so it's better to hire local help to, to figure out where you are. That's a long story about nothing, but stick with me. So negligence per se. Now this is, this is where most surveyors they don't, you don't, your best defense is that you weren't negligent and that you made you uh, arguably you, you met the standard of care because that's a little bit of a squishy thing unless there's a hard written black and white letter of law or letter of a manual that you've clearly blatantly failed. But most surveyors in my experience don't actually get to the point where they can defend themselves against a negligence claim because usually there's a negligence per se, which means there's a violation of law. And the, you failed to follow the law in your particular state. And that can be uh, failed to, uh, like in Nevada, to track your error, probability of error at 95%. And you have a, a, an urban survey and you didn't survey to that specification, specification. So when you have a violation of law, the, you're negligent right off the rip and you're not going to get to the squishy part where two surveyors have the same evidence and they come up with a different answer. And so they, they aren't gonna have an expert. And this is where most of these surveys actually fall down is uh, usually there's a violation of law or, in a, or the next thing they do is there's a violation of the contract. If you're signing contracts by sophisticated parties and you've been signing the same contract with that same party for a lot of years, you generally could be signing away your rights to those contracts through the indemnification process, through that, that contract contracting process. And so you want to get, as a land surveyor, you want to get to the argument that you met the standard of care. That's your defense as well as what they're going to say you didn't, but at least there's a, an argument to be made. If you broke the law in the course of your contract or you broke the surveying laws in the course of your work, you're not gonna have that defense. And it gets bad and then it, usually uh, the insurance companies come in there and start try to mitigate their losses uh, if they find out that you've broken laws. Now, one of the things that you have as a surveyor that you're pretty lucky of is in that the attorneys involved in these cases cannot believe for one minute that their client broke the law. Like if you say, oh no, they've done it lots of times. Like I know this person that never files records of survey, or I know this person that, that only, you know, re recovers monuments on the surface. And that's a, that's a violation of the law. And it takes them a minute because in their profession, regardless of their reputation, it's somewhat unconscionable that anybody would just break the law as a matter of practice, uh, you know, maybe through an inadvertent act. And so it takes them a minute to wrap their mind around it. But surveyors break laws, uh, in at least in the California jurisdictions that I'm in, and they don't actually get the benefit of a defense that they met the standard of care. That's negligence per se. So you say, wow, geez, nobody breaks the law, or, you know, that, that, that must just be those California people that break in the law. Well, here's, here's an example of what I see a lot. Uh, everybody has their camera off, but if I said, yeah, have you ever heard of a record boundary? And I'd see a bunch of heads nodding up and down and, and say, yeah, yeah, there's a record boundary. And I would ask, what is a record boundary, particularly in connection with a field survey? 
And the, the, what they would say is they'd say, well, you go out and you find a couple monuments and you take the, the legal description and you rotate it to those monuments and that's a record boundary. I said, oh, all right, uh, where did you read about that, um, this record boundary? Is, is it in Brown? Is it in the local DOT manuals? Where did you find this record boundary? And I don't think you'll find it because every year in the course when I was teaching this class, I would say if anybody can bring in a record boundary definition that is connected to a field survey, not just a lot in a track, connected to a field survey, I would give them whatever I give them, 100 bucks or something. And that, that definition doesn't exist. You're not going to find a manual that defines a record boundary. And where are the procedures? Of course, there are no procedures. What are the benefits? Well, there's one benefit. The benefit is cost savings to a client. So what you do is you go out, they, 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 they kind of use it as a uh, planning tool. They'll say, well, we went out, we did a record boundary and to see if the project would go forward and if they would design a house and you know, they were gonna probably end up doing a, a, a subdivision map or something like that. Th that's kind of how the story goes along. And we just want to get our foot in the door. Well, when you take a record boundary, let's say it's a, a meets and bounds description and you rotate it to a couple monuments, and then you you know you show your topography on there, and then you it goes out of your office. What do you think they do with that? Well, they start planning. Now let's imagine that you have a lot that's 50 feet wide in the in the record, and you put it on a couple monuments, you put it on a benchmark, and so now you have a boundary and a re, or, or a topo with a record boundary. So they decide that they have a five foot setbacks on either side or on each side. And so they design, design a building that is 40 feet wide based on this record boundary. Well, they go ahead and design the building, doors, windows, all the expense that goes into that. Well, at what point when you go out and do a real boundary and you determine that that lot's actually 49 feet wide, how do, you break, how do you broach that topic with the client that their building won't actually fit on the lot? Have you, have you done the correct thing as far as a licensed land surveyor goes and have you done the correct thing as far as this boundary goes? I would say most likely not, uh, at least in, in, in the practice that I'm aware of because the only bad things can come from that. Now, when you, if you're building a 50 foot wide building, let's say it's a commercial building and you do a record boundary, think about this. You're putting your license in harm's way to save somebody that probably has several million dollars to build a project to save them a few thousand dollars of going around the block and finding all the monuments. That in and of itself doesn't make sense to what we want to practice or how we want to work. That's why you don't do a record boundary. You're trying to save, in many instances, millionaires a few thousand dollars when they're only going to go forward on that boundary. And this is where it comes in. Now, how do I get involved in these, especially during the construction side? Well, on, on, a, on a large property, how I get involved in them is the neighbor has an issue with what they're doing next door. Could be a noise issue. Usually it's a fence issue. They tore down a fence while they were gone for the week on vacation. They cut down some trees that they always thought were theirs. That's how these get, that's how they, they come to me is it's usually a neighbor or an adjoining property owner feels as though they were slighted. So then I come out and of course I have the, the, the time and the budget to go dig up all these monuments and to find these shortages. And then the whole dynamic changes completely. And that surveyor is in a whole lot of trouble because now they're going through redesign and these kind of things. That's like one scenario of how that comes up. How did it come up? Well, because the surveyor wanted to get the work and they did a record boundary. That's how it comes up. And so there's really, if anybody has, when we start the discussion part, any thoughts on a record boundary, I'm really interested in it. But normally when you set up a contract, because what happens is, is the surveyors will set up their contract and it'll say, Topo and boundary, you know, uh, five, five, 500 bucks. Topo and boundary, 500 bucks. Well, right there, you're in trouble because 
the boundary and the topo in the jurisdictions that I work in, actually the boundary a lot of times will cost a lot more than the topo. And so when Thank I you. lump them together, boundary and topo, I'm making a, I don't say record boundary, I just say boundary and topo. And right there's where surveyors start to get into trouble. You should have your contract set up to say topo, topographic mapping, topographic survey, uh, $250. Boundary five hundred dollars total is seven hundred fifty dollars, and you initial by each one of these items. Well, when they see that the boundary costs substantially more than the topography, a lot of times they don't want to pay for it, and that's fine. I give them a topo, and it shows fences and walls and contours and everything else. And then they say, "Well, where's the boundary?" I say, "Well, that's that's a whole different item." You wanted a topography map and I gave you one. Well, I can't build anything or design anything without a boundary. Well, then initial that part of the contract and we'll go back out and do it. Because you have to separate those out because when you say boundary and topo, you're making, it's, it's hard for you to recover from that if you, because you never really know what a boundary is gonna take you. You start digging up monuments, you start running into trouble. And then depending on whether, what your role in that particular company is, depends on what, how much effort you put into it. If you're not the owner or principal, then you might have a different, different set of circumstances to consider on that. But boundary and topo are actually two different things. You should separate them in your contract. And a lot of these surveyors that get into trouble, they just say boundary and topo, you know, five bucks and separate them out so that you have a separate line item so that they can see that cost differential and if they're not willing to pay for it, then don't give it to them. Uh, one of the things, and I, I've been interested when we talk about this, one of the things I've done in the past is uh, in, our, in our jurisdictions, all the agencies tend to have a GIS system and it's based on a coordinate system, some Epic or whatever. So I tell them boundary and topo, separate items, and they, they only want the topography. I give it to them, they want the boundary. And I tell them, go on the county website and grab that GIS. I'll put you on state plane coordinates and I'll put you on a 2017.5 EPIC. And if the boundary is unimportant to you, go grab it off, offline. And they'll say, well, how accurate is it? I go, it depends on which EPIC you're in. <laughs> it depends on how they built it. And they said, well, that won't do. Well, then, then pay for it. it you know, if, if the boundary is not important and you're not willing to pay for it, then go grab your own. Well, if you realize that that one could be off many, many feet, well then now we're back and talking about boundaries. If they're not willing to just put their boundary in off a GIS system, which if I'm on state planning coordinates in the LA basin for the most part, they're within five to seven feet, depending on the epic, three feet, depending on the epic and depending on the neighborhood. But don't give them away, don't give away your boundaries because that's where the trouble is. Different topic for a different day. Chain of title. Okay, the next thing where I see surveyors get into trouble with uh, boundary surveying is they'll have a preliminary title report, maybe doing an ALTA or something, and they'll survey the description in the title report and they don't pull the adjoining descriptions. Well, now under the new ALTA standards, that's a violation of the standard, so you're already in trouble. But prior standards, you will not find a gap or an overlap if you don't pull the adjoining uh, title, the adjoining deeds to the property. I'll give an example. If you have a lot and it's the uh, the original lot was 100 feet square, and you had the east 50 was you what you were surveying, and you went out and established the east line and went over 50 feet. Well, if you didn't look at the other side and it said realized that it said the west half, well that's not the same as the east 50, and the and the west half. Or if you went to the other side and it said the west 50, but you measured the entire lot and it was no longer 100 feet let's say it was 99, you won't ever find a gap or overlap if you don't pull the adjoining deed documents, particularly in the meets and bounds situations. So if you're doing a boundary survey and it calls out to a senior document, thence to the adjoining lands of Smith, and you don't pull that adjoining lands of Smith, you're negligent. That's just a quick, you didn't do it because your deed called for it and you have no idea where it was. So when you see just back to the basics where you see the words to, to a document, you have to pull that document and you have to review it and you have to generally establish it. 
if you don't do these things, those are easy cases for, uh, for negligence and chain of title. When you, when you pull a chain of title, it's a, you, ha you have to do that to determine the junior or senior rights. If you're only surveying the document that was given to you and your preliminary title report, you're not going to know if you're junior or if you're senior. We've spent a lot of time being educated on this material and we've been tested on this material. We don't always practice to this material. Now, if you're tested for the minimum competence when you take a licensed land surveyor test and then every test for minimum competence includes some flavor of junior and senior, but then when you go practice, you don't do that. That's it. That's a, that's a negligence. It's the test for minimum competence. So when we look at this, I just covered this, the junior and senior relationship, that's minimum competence. And if you don't recognize that in the course of your every boundary survey you do that could possibly have a junior senior relationship, meaning not a simultaneous conveyance, then that's negligence by definition. And, and we'll go through. So conflicting descriptions, not a boundary class, but if we're determining, were you negligent in, did you meet the standard of care in determining this boundary? These rights are pretty much the same in all jurisdictions, uh, Nevada or are not rights, these uh, orders of rules of construction. Uh, they're the same in Nevada as they're the same in California, the same in most of the Western states. And so the question is, number one thing is monuments. Now, if there's a monument in the ground and it's referenced and it, it has some kind of pedigree and you didn't find it, we really don't care about the rest of these things because I've, I've been in a deposition and this is kind of the drama because there's not a lot of drama in these things is you show them a photograph and you say, you see this monument right here? Yes, in the photograph. If, if the attorney says this, I don't. And they say, if we represented to you that this monument was at the Northwest corner of the property line in question, would that change your solution? And they'll say, well, I don't know. It depends on where it is. Well, we're gonna tell you that it actually exists. So where, where does that put your boundary today? Well, they have nothing further to say about that because if there's a monument in the ground and I'm, I'm so worried about that particular detail and I've seen that come back on so many surveyors in so many instances that as a matter of practice, when I'm involved in litigation or very difficult boundaries, I personally go out and I look not only at the monuments that they found, but I double check for the monuments they didn't <clears throat> I have our field crews say on there, search found nothing at every location. And I go look for those monuments that could that, be. Um, yes. I mean, if in um, I think we got it now. She was kept unmuting herself and then still talking, so. Oh, okay. Well, we'll, we'll get a chance. Yeah, I think we're good now. Yeah, so, so then you see recital of a boundary of a record such as a map or deed, uh, distances and bearings. So if you don't, if you fall short on your research, you're negligent. So if you produce a, a set of field notes uh, that, that predate something and you can put a, a, a date on a monument because monuments hold over maps and monuments hold over uh, 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 practically everything. It's as soon as you recover that research, unless you found it in, in, in you know, some place that not every, it wasn't available to every surveyor, that's a failure to meet the standard of care. And so I've had those situations come up quite often where you'll say, have you seen this set of field notes? Uh, this is LS2210 in California, WK Hilliard, all these notes are available to you at the Orange County Surveyor's Office. And he found this, six by six wood post in 1935. I found it and you're six feet off of it. Well, there's a problem right there. That's the end of it. And that, that's a real thing that happened and so on and so forth. So it really comes to putting things together step by step. step. So now the intent, these are, these are just surveyors make mistakes on these areas. The other one is intent. So the surveyor will say, well, 
they have the east 50 feet and they have the west 50 feet. And when I surveyed the lot as a whole, it was 104 feet. And so I have east 50, west 50, and I have a four foot gap down the middle. And so the intent was to divest themselves out of all the property. Well, actually that's not true because in the statute of frauds with land, 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 land must be conveyed in writing. It can't be conveyed by verbal, I'm gonna give you 50 feet, it must be conveyed in writing. And so the intent is actually what was written. So they intended to give you 50 feet, they owned 50 feet, and they divested themselves of 50 feet. There is no intent written, written into that. And that, if you guys want to do some more research, that's where surveyors get a lot of trouble is they'll, they'll determine the intent of a document and it's outside of the writing. There's a lot to teach on that, but basically if you want to know a little bit about it, it's called the four corners. And so when they say you read the documents by the four corners, you applied meaning to the ordinary meaning to those words and you placed it on the ground and without determining the intent, because if the, if the document is clear and unambiguous, there's no reason to determine the intent. When you jump outside of that document, you have to be careful and you have to know what you're doing. Now, I'm not talking about what Jeff Lucas says where you put a deed on the ground and you're a deed staker I'm saying that if it's the East 50 and the West 50, and there's 104 feet, that four feet rests in the ownership of the underlying owner. Now, let's say it's been like that for 50 years, so on and so forth, there's, there's walls and occupation. Well, then you have to clean up the title and you have to catch the, the title up to the possession. And there's a number of ways you can do that. You can write out the interest of the party by doing a lot line adjustment, or something like that. But if somebody comes back and says, hey, where's my four feet? That's on you. But chances are they're not going to come back and get their four feet, but you can't make that jump out of that document and create something that wasn't in that document in that conveyance. And that's what I'm talking about where surveyors incur liability in these cases. And so how does that work? Well, here, here's what happens. If you read Brown or you read Waddles, or you read the books that we're all used to, what they say is, is that the senior grant gets full measure and the junior gets the remainder. And that's 100% true when you're short. It's not true when you're long. So if you had 99 feet and you had the East 50 and the West 50, well, the West 50, if it's junior, the, the original grantor didn't have the 50 feet to give. So you got 45 feet, you were shorted. Now, if you were bought it by square footage, you might have some kind of claim with, uh, with the person who sold it to you. But as a general rule, that's how, not as general rule, that's actually how that works. It doesn't apply when, there's, when you're long and you have 105 feet. It's East 50 and West 50, those parties are contractually whole. The party who granted them had that property and they conveyed it. This is another where, place where surveyors get into trouble. Now, we know that these, these gap overlaps only exist in title. Uh, they're not actually on the ground. And again, the, the gaps are resolved by junior senior rights. You determine the junior senior rights as a land surveyor by pulling the adjoining documents and taking it back to the parent conveyance. And that's how you determine them. And you determine who has the priority. But gaps in title in excess actually exist and it belongs to the original grantor. Basic, basic stuff that we get tested on for minimum competence. But for some reason, when surveyors get out there and, and, and kick those training wheels off, they, they, they start doing, making these kind of decisions and they start incurring liability. Now, the interesting thing is, is how much liability? Well, it, it really depends because these boundary surveys are sleeping liabilities, meaning you can get away with this for a really long time because the question, your boundary is unlikely to be questioned for a period of many years, maybe an entire career. But there's no statute of limitations in California for your boundary surveys. It's generally four years after discovery. So if you did a boundary 25 years ago, just got your license, you know, you're, you're, you're learning your ways, 
learning your way around. You maybe threw a couple of curveballs, and and I'll be frank, you know, I threw a couple of curveballs. I just didn't realize there were curveballs in my career because this is an accumulated experience. And I had excellent mentorship. I was always surrounded by many, many good professionals, but they can't prepare you for every situation. And so you get out there and you get that thing up on one wheel. <laughs> you look back when you're going through the job folder and you're like, my gosh, I hope that never comes up. I mean, it was done in good, good faith, but it, I have no coverage, meaning I have no defense. And, uh, you know, I, I've went back and cleaned up some of those because my experience was such I didn't realize. And uh, so, you know, you go do that. And, and uh, that's just the way it goes. Everybody's capable of this. There is no holier than thou. You, you'll throw a curveball once in a while and, and you really have to focus on who's doing the work with you. Do you trust those field crews? What's their background? How long have they been doing this? It comes down to those things. So back to this uh, legal principles, understanding that if there's a statute, it takes precedence over a case law. Case law, this is where other surveyors get into trouble is they'll, they'll pull up some random case and they'll say, well, you know, in, in, in this case, this is how we did this. And they, they, they tie on to that, onto that, that case law. Well, that case has very, we're not attorneys and we're not trained as attorneys. And there's very particular things within that case, nuances that we may not see or we may not realize. And those cases generally are not going to apply to your boundary surveys uh, because you have a different fact set. You have something you like about it that's in common, but ultimately it'll be a judge that determines that. And so, Case law is just, that's a warning. But again, most, most surveyors never get that far in these, in these standard of care uh, issues. Most of them violate uh, statutes. They don't follow the laws uh, within their jurisdiction. And so they usually don't have to get to that point. Um, conveyance documents, I'm not going to read this to you, but just take a second if you can see the screen and read that. The most important part of that sentence is, is the legal theories of repose, estoppel, acquiescence, prescription, et cetera, need to have sp uh, very specific elements proven and confirmed by the court, not a surveyor. So we all know adverse possession, open and notorious, uh, hostile, paid taxes, so on and so forth. We're, we're trained in these things in a cursory level, but a surveyor is not qualified uh, to make a determination. I've, I've been involved in some surveys and I call the client back and say, hey, well, what, whatever happened with that? And they say, well, we, the neighbor hired another surveyor and apparently everything's okay because we own the property because of adverse possession. I'm like, no kidding. Surveyors can't make that determination. Uh, those are very fact-driven and, and applying the law. You can't make a de determination of adverse possession. All you can do as a surveyor is evidence it. I see legal descriptions periodically where they'll show a road on the legal description flat and they'll say uh, location of the road uh, by prescription. Well, wait a minute. You're actually impa impacting somebody's rights because now when that flat records, now there's evidence that says there's a prescriptive right, but the court hasn't made a determination. And more importantly, the rights of the underlying owner have been uh, I don't know what the cross, let's say, because you've just impacted their title. Now there's something called slander of title and you can be sued for that because you've impacted their title by putting on prescription and they never had a chance to defend against the claim because they all have rights. And that's where the attorney's officers of the court come in and defend their client's rights. We aren't really that well trained in the nuances of property rights. We're more trained in the way of location. So don't write prescription, adverse possession. Don't advise your clients of this. Uh, evidence it and uh, wait for the attorney to call you. Uh, I'll, I'm going to uh, let you read this.
this is California civil code, but I'm sure Nevada has something similar. These are most of these laws and civil procedures in this case, they go back to the 1880s. California was made a state in 1850 and they're generally the same in all the Western states. Everybody's adopted a similar version and it's, it's very old law. Most of it's well over hundred years old. But the point is, is if you don't have ambiguity, then you, you generally take the terms of the deed as it fits within the adjoining deeds. Uh, if you have ambiguity, you don't offer legal theories on that because that's, you incur liability. I'm just about through with the, the long, the long notes. This is the last one. This one came from uh, Kurt Brown's second edition. This is before Robillard and everybody was involved. And that's just saying what I said. You take it by the four corners and you you put it you put it together. It doesn't mean you put it on the ground as a deed staker, but you don't introduce elements that aren't there. You respect the rights of the adjoiners. Uh, one of the things is, is create a gap depending on what kind of land you're dealing with. If you're dealing with public lands out in the middle of the desert, you don't create a gap for a foot or five feet uh, because there's errors in the measurements and you don't hold strictly to that. So uh, uh, there's something called de minimis. And so you don't create gaps due to de minimis and holding measurements over monuments. That's the opposite of what I just told you. But if you're a surveyor, you understand the differences between those two. And it's something to always think, think about when you do this. The other thing that surveyors do often, and this is don't do this. Uh, I call them squirrel notes. Do not put these, what you think are relieving you of potential liability notes on your map. This map is not a boundary survey, but you have a solid line around it and you show dimensions to the, uh, to the building, something similar to that. You'll put these notes on there. If you're going to skirt the standard or skirt the practice, don't put a note on it that, on the document that you're going to sign you're much more defendable not to put these notes on your map because it shows that you had an awareness that you weren't meeting the standard and then you sign the document. So when you put these squirrel notes on there and say, uh, this, is, this is this or this is not that or I didn't do this, but I did do that. If you put that note on there, it shows that you have an awareness that you might not be meeting a standard. And then when you sign it, it actually works very, very much against you in a, in, when you get into a, a court situation. And, and why is that? You say, well, I, I tried to let them know what I was doing. <clears throat> I say, okay, so you let your client know. Uh, let me ask your client if they know what the difference is between a, a Northeast bearing and a Southwest bearing. Let me ask your client if they understand tenths as opposed to inches. So the point being is your client doesn't understand that note. So they don't read, they don't, you don't make what's called informed consent. You don't get to the standard of informed consent where you say, I'm going to give you a record boundary. And what that means is that even though I show it as 50 feet and you're going to design to 50 feet, it might not be 50 feet. It could actually be 49. It could actually be 51. It could be any other number we could guess at. That would be informed consent. And then I want you to sign right here that you understand you're designing a building on a lot that I don't know what the dimension is. Okay, well, maybe you met informed consent at that point. But the point is, is those notes work against you if you're doing something. So don't put them on your map because they're going to hurt you in the long run or maybe alternatively just do the job right. But that's, that's, that's up to you. Um, you cannot contract to break the law. So... Uh, if uh, the law says in California that uh, I require a record of survey because I've hit a certain trigger, the law says in Nevada that I have to be within 500 for an urban survey, I can't contract out of those obligations. I can't say, well, my client said it was okay if I didn't do that. What that looks like in a, in a case is it goes like this. The surveyor did everything correctly. They put topo, boundary, record of survey, and they itemized everything. And the surveyor sent the contract to the client, and then they started doing work on the job before the contract came back. 
Well, when the contract came back, the, sur the, the client had scribbled out the record to survey because it was a pretty pricey line item. And so he said, not required, and he scribbled it out. Well, several, several lessons there. One is, is don't start a job without the contract, because if you send the contract out and you start the job, you accept the terms of the contract as it came back to you. So he's obligated to do the record of survey, but the client's not obligated to pay him. That's a problem. Another lesson in that particular case is don't ever sign a contract and send it out. Send the contract out and with, when it comes back, then sign it and send them a copy. Because in that case, the surveyor had signed the contract, sent it out. The owner of the project scribbled out part of the scope of work and the, the obligation and sent it back. So everybody had a signed contract that crossed that off. And now he has this legal obligation. Of course, he didn't honor the obligation. Of course, the boundary wasn't in the right location. And that cost him uh, $225,000 only because he had a $500,000 policy and he'd already paid 275 on it that year. So it only cost him 225. Uh, backstory is, is the attorney would have actually taken like a buck 50, but it was so bad that he had broken all these laws. So standard of care as it pertains to boundaries, there's a lot of lessons in that little job out in the middle of nowhere. And one is, is don't sign a contract and send it out. Two is don't start work on a job until the signed contract gets back because if it comes back in different shape, different wording, your, ob your obligations are the same, but you, they're not obligated to pay you. And so that, that was just a different case. Um, where are we? We're just about done here. Uh, looking at our time, correct survey. Uh, and this, this reads right into it. Go ahead and read that slide. And in copying this slide, that's actually Curtis Brown. I, I recognize it. That's something that Kurt Brown wrote, and uh, that's not my own. And it just says, while there are times when a property owner will agree that an inaccurate or approximate property line will suffice for his purpose, the surveyor ought not to accept that commission. In the GIS world, have them go get their own boundary. Uh, that's what I've done. I'm interested when we open this up for discussion, what people say is I say, I'll put you on 2017.5 Epic and the county's on something similar. I don't know what, <laughs> go get your boundary off their GIS. Okay, specify standards. So, all this stuff and all these millions of dollars and everything's paid out, how do you avoid this? Well, what you do is specify a standard for the work that you're gonna do and then survey to that standard. Uh, when you do a boundary survey and it's not an ALTA survey, a lot of times I will grab portions of the ALTA survey standards and I put them right into my contract. Uh, why? Because they're a nationally accepted standard they're accepted in all 50 states. They're accepted by the title companies. They're accepted by the lenders and they're accepted by the survey community. There really is no better standard than an ALTA standard. Now, the interesting thing about the ALTA standards to me are people will call it a Cadillac survey or the, uh, the Cadillac of surveys. But the ALTA, if you read at the top, it's the minimum standard detail. So that minimum standard detail that's good enough for Mississippi, good enough for Wyoming, certainly is good enough for Orange County, California. And it's not a Cadillac, it's a minimum standard survey. If you survey to whatever portions of those standards that you like, you are, and, and you can make that standard, you are extremely defendable if you follow those standards. Um, if you have a standard in any other standard, pull one out of anywhere and you survey to that standard, you're very, very defendable. And you're gonna be defendable from future lawsuits if you pick a standard and survey to it. Now, knowing that and doing that, I don't do that on all of my surveys. A lot of them are uh, 
let's say run of the mill type surveys. But I would advise myself to do, why not do it? We survey to that standard every time. And you never know when one of these surveys are gonna get out of hand. Uh, everything's going along fine. You have a bad neighbor. Next thing you know, you're in a lawsuit. So it, it, boundary surveying, NSPS, ALTA standards, whenever I believe there's gonna be some litigation. Now here's something interesting about that type of litigation. The litigation is seldom over feet. It's usually over inches. Uh, boundary litigation, you can have two or three feet. Everybody agrees, and it really doesn't matter if it's two feet or if it's three feet. Uh, there's not a lot of survey wonkiness in there. Uh, and it, those, those actually tend to get resolved better. It's the ones that are less than a foot that cause all the problems. And so that's something to be aware of. Um, next slide, we're almost done here, certificates. Don't sign any certificates that you don't understand what they say or that they include words or procedures that you haven't executed and you can't document. Uh, one of the ones that used to be is the ALTA standards used to include something about, uh, I don't know, wetlands or something like that, or the ALTA standards used to include trash uh, I don't, I don't remember what they were now offhand, but there were things that as surveyors, very few of us would know anything about. And we all signed those certificates. Well, that's a big problem. And those certificates that I probably signed, uh, fortunately never came up because, uh, I wouldn't have a leg to stand on. And now that I understand this stuff much better, uh, don't, don't sign anything that you don't have documentation and proof of. And let's go back to this. And that is about 12 weeks worth of work in an hour. <laughs> I, I have a lot more, but go ahead. That's good stuff. Yeah, no, we'll definitely uh, make some time where we'll get you back on and we'll kind of digest each one of them one at a time. So that'd be cool. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, just as a quick housekeeping, uh, these are people from all across the country. So Colorado, Florida, you name it. So not just uh, California, Nevada. Oh. So oh. yeah, exactly. We're from all over. So uh, I know, looks like uh, Rob threw his hand up first. So we'll go with Rob and then we'll go down the line. Hey, Dave, thanks for a great presentation. Uh, just as expected. Of course. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, <clears throat> One of the uh, one of the things that you mentioned was um, you start working on on a boundary project and you know like a topo on a boundary and you think it's going to be a slam dunk and you run into trouble. So by that you mean unexpected monumentation or lack of monumentation or conflicting evidence or you know can you elaborate on that just to, uh, for you know thirty seconds. Yeah, sure. You, you, you go out and you find some, some current maps with some current monuments in the area. And so you're thinking, wow, well, just go find these four monuments and, uh, you know, have this boundary nailed down and you get out there and none of those monuments were ever originally set. Uh, now you start going outside of it and you realize, wait a minute, now, now I'm double proportioning or now I'm really outside the limits and these things come undone. That's, that's a real common one, or they've been paved over and I have to dig them up. And some surveyors have a hard time determining between being profitable and uh, doing, meeting the standard of care. Right, right. And um, you also uh, mentioned in, in the testing for minimal competence and the uh, um, junior senior rights recognizing those on the exam but then not considering them in your professional practice um, not yours but in one's professional practice and not only i think does that meet the level of negligence but it can also be um incompetence and that's a, a separate finding that you really didn't get into too much um and I think that that one of the reasons that that Trent has has uh, got mentoring Mondays set up is to just raise these concepts to the up and comers and the 
you know, our field staff across the country, because we see so many um, pictures on Facebook where there's, you know, two and three and more monuments that punched around in the same location. And, and like that photo that you showed to start off, you know, you put a shovel in the ground a foot away, half a foot away from the, the hub that was set and you found the original monument. Um, you know, that our licensed professionals are so are relying so much on these um, young people that are going to the field that maybe aren't getting the training they need, the, the understanding of these concepts. So thank you again for, for putting this on. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, Rob, thanks. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah. Uh, one of, just before I grab uh, Jonathan, one of the things you talked about is some of the smaller disputes last the longest, right? I have a, uh, I have a boundary line adjustment slash dispute that's gone 15 years, two months. And it's basically you know, a sliver of land that's probably a foot on the west end uh, down to like two tenths on the east end. So 15 years, two months, it's damn near half of my uh, career, more than half of my career already. It's crazy. Uh, Jonathan, go for it. There you go. You're unmuted. You can try to chat, Jonathan. He's lost his mic. <laughs> we'll get it back on. Uh, there you go. Perfect. Can you hear him? Yep. John. Now you're hearing me, Dave Woolley, Trent. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah, I lost him. But to, to your point, that's that's what the surveyors have to think about is if you're under a foot and you have a problem, that's the one you need to document. And when you document it as a matter of boundary work, do you usually locate the immediately adjacent structures, walls, fences on that boundary line? Because the supervising land surveyor responsible for that work, uh, he may not see that. And so he assumes that those two monuments, that's a straight line between them and there's really no concern. So your crew needs to locate those walls because if that wall isn't in the right place, well, isn't where the owner thinks it is and it isn't between those monuments, that supervising land surveyor needs to know that. So as a matter of practice, you should be locating immediately adjacent improvements so that you can get a handle on it. Because what happens is, is the surveyor doesn't know that that's there and then the neighbor that hired you goes in and starts tearing things up, starts moving things around based on they paid for a survey and the other person didn't, and now you're off to the races. And it's usually a tree, wall, fence. Uh, usually it's an old rickety fence, been there a long time. Yeah. Starts all the problems. Got it. So Jonathan typed his question since his mic wasn't working. Uh, my question is, could you go over separating out the boundary, the topo and the record of surveys uh, in your contracts? Maybe dig into that a little bit deeper. Sure. Uh, what, what you want to do is you want to say that you're going to provide topo topography and if it's the right type of survey, like Nevada has standards, so you're going to want to cite the standard that's required for the accuracy or your understanding of that. Maybe use national map accuracy standards and then on the boundary, you're gonna want that to be a separate line item because the boundary a lot of times is gonna cost a lot more than topography. And you want them to initial those are separate. Then the record of survey, if you trigger the statutes that file, require the filing of a record of survey, then you wanna put that in there that that's required by law and you'll be filing it. And if there's filing fees associated with that, you wanna put that all in the front end of that contract so that the client has an awareness of the differences because when they get the the proposal from your competitor and they say boundary and topo five hundred dollars uh you're immediately looking more educated and you are educating that client and you want to explain to them that this record of survey is a statutory requirement and then they can go back to the other person, uh, presuming you have a, even if you don't have a conversation just based on it and say, are these apples and apples, apples and oranges? And they can start asking the other surveyor, how come, uh, how come you didn't include a record of survey? 
And if they start saying, well, you know, it's a record boundary, uh, you know, it starts getting a little shaky, then you've at least educated that client. Uh, so separate them out and educate your client. And once you write it up once, you just copy it from proposal to proposal. Yeah, good, perfect. Does that help, Jonathan? You can type in there. Um, before I get to George, uh, Mike had a question, which has been a kind of a national issue lately, which would be uh, monument preservation. How do you deal with DOTs, cities and counties that call and want pavement for road repairs on monuments excavated? So somebody digging up the monument. So I think in Mike's situation, they probably dug a hole trying to dig up the monument, right? And uh, created a nice foot round circle and created a little pothole. And so now the city and county is wanting you to come back and fill it. Is that probably the question there, Mike? Well, that has happened occasionally, but uh, the one that really struck me was just because uh, a survey was done in the area and somebody had excavated in the area that we practice a lot. They called and asked, did you dig this up? And I'm going, we haven't been out there in a couple of years in that area. And they're trying to point the finger of, you know, who do we need to talk to to get our road repaired? Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll let you, well, you got any issues with that, Mike? All right, Dave. Well, we do have some issues uh, because what, what happens is, is the city engineers, because I function as a city surveyor in a few different jurisdictions. And one of the issues we have is when you have new pavement and somebody digs it up, it compromises the integrity of that pavement and the, it ends up being a problem. So the engineer side of the house is very concerned about that kind of thing. Equally though, the city or county or whoever is paving over those monuments in California, we have laws that require us to bring it to the surface. And so it's kind of chasing your tail around there. We, we try to keep up with the monument preservation and keep them on the surface. But when we don't, and somebody digs a hole, it's kind of hard for us to go back and complain that, yeah, they shouldn't have dug a hole basically if we had done our job as the agency. And that's an education process that will never end. I'll be having that discussion a hundred years from now because <laughs> it's chasing our tail around. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that for sure. Um, and the same, same situation like here in Nevada, I'm sure, I don't know about the rest of the country, but we're in the same situation with the repavement projects, you know, they bring them all to the surface or that kind of stuff. So uh, go for it, George. One more if I, uh, George, uh, SM mute. Okay, so as far as the boundary survey and the record of survey issue, almost everything we do related to boundaries in Nevada, realistically, if you really read the law, requires a record of survey or a corner record or something to be filed showing what we found and what we did. Uh, so we typically include the preparation of that information for filing in the boundary survey uh, estimate. And then if we end up in a situation where we don't have to file it, hey, fine, that's, we, don't have to, we don't have to charge for that. But we usually do that stuff time and materials because we, it's an unknown item. We don't know what it's gonna take. We give them an estimate. And then for the, for the filing of that document, we know what that's gonna cost. And so we can, we can include that as task three or four or whatever the heck it's supposed to be. So that they know that, that they're on the hook for that if and, if and when it happens. But we try and cover our bases so that we're protected regardless. Yeah, good, good information. Yeah, that's ideal actually. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I will say like, uh, you know, with California, some of the review stuff, I mean, I see a lot of proposals for California record surveys where reviewing is all based on TNM just because you never know what kind of jurisdictional comments you're going to get back. So, yeah. Anybody else got any more questions? There's got to be more on this kind of topic. <laughs> hey, Trent, I threw, uh, I threw one in the chat. Does every state have a monument tape, monument perpetuation law? Yeah. Um, so maybe uh, folks around the country can uh, chime in on that. Yeah. 
One of the things that I'd be interested in, Trent, is uh, I was reviewing the statutes in Nevada uh, yeah. where I need to be, and it says that if you find a discrepancy, you're required to prepare a report and send that to the client. Uh, does that happen more often than not? Uh, do, do people comply with that? Um, I would say no, and not, not in more recent history, maybe uh, Dave or George could chime in maybe on the old days, but I would say most of that um, with the discrepancies, I mean, we typically reach out to the other surveyor if we're having, you know, major discrepancy, but I wouldn't say a written report given to the client though. Yeah, because I was reading and, and there is a uh, like you say, there's an obligation to contact a surveyor in which you have a disagreement. Yep. And then, but then there's another part here. I'm just scrolling through to see, uh, and I'll, I'll put the screen up. But there's something in the law that says you, if you find a discrepancy, you're supposed to uh, notify them. And I thought, well, that's awesome if people actually do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have a lot of awesome laws in California that people don't actually do. <laughs> right. I thought that was kind of a cool thing, though, if people actually did it, and anybody else that's on the call uh, that that might have it. So uh, I'm just going to share uh, some Nevada statutes real quick because I thought they were actually pretty interesting. And if I pull that up, and while you're doing that, so Jen's uh, Jen's got a question in the chat, and Jen is a college student and just kind of getting in the profession. Can you put a a record of survey in a nutshell for me? She says it doesn't sound like something we do or have in this area. So, yes, a record of survey in California is required under the Business of Professions Code. It specifies uh, it's 18 by 26. It's on Mylar and it gets filed in the public record. And so that record of survey is available to anybody in the future, forever in the record. And I, I'm sure Nevada is pretty similar. Yeah, Nevada's, Nevada's right on the same page with that, only we, we uh, have a little larger format. Ours is uh, uh, 20, what, 24 by 32, I think, if I remember right. Yep. Only filed a few of those. Yep. Uh, but the, the main deal is it's all it is is showing what you found and what you did and, and how it relates to everything else around. That, that you dealt with and, and it, it really is good information. And as far as the question about contacting uh, surveyors about uh, conflicts, many times it's been, I've done that and I've been contacted a few times and you know, it's amazing how many, how many times you can sit down with someone, look at their information, look at your information and say, oh, you know, I don't think we disagree as much as we think we do. Uh, you had some information I didn't have. I maybe had some information you didn't have. And between the two of us, we can resolve this and make all of our clients happy. Yeah, I think, and whole. Where, I think where Dave was going with that was we were supposed to like provide a written report to the client that we found these discrepancies. So. Yeah, I've, I've maybe done two. Yeah. Got it. Well. <laughs> I, I think that written report is your record of survey. If you find a discrepancy, yeah. you're required to file that record of survey. Yeah. I would that agree. being the written report. I would agree with that statement there. Yeah. No, that's that's fair. So one of the things, and I, Trent told me that not everybody here is actually in California. So I'm I'm gonna or in in Nevada. I'm gonna bring up something here. So this is out of the. Uh, Nevada statutes and uh, the positional certainty, and this is a 95%. And if you look, you have land boundary surveys, high urban, and there's a definition of high urban. It's kind of commercial, industrial, uh, condominium, so on and so forth. Not single family residents, which tend to be low urban. Uh, so we have a high urban standard here that is five hundredths at 95% uh, positional certainty. So Here's an example. If you have an ALTA of a commercial industrial property, the ALTA standards are 700, 50 parts per million, but the state law says you're 500. Right there is a potential problem in a standard to care issue because if you surveyed to the ALTA standards, but you didn't make the, and so you, let's say you give me a Starnet adjustment, your, your survey's called into question. 
okay, you said you met that standard, but if I start looking through your adjustment and realize that you broke state law, we don't really need to talk about the other standard. That's an example of something. And then you have your topographic surveys down here and three hundredths to three tenths engineering design surveys. The first question will be is how did you check it? And that's kind of how these things work. And when I run through these Nevada statutes, um, pretty interesting uh, compared to what we have in California. Now, I mentioned earlier about the research section. So in Nevada statutes here, it says that you're conducting a land boundary survey, search pertinent documents, including but not limited to maps, deeds, title reports, title opinions, and records of the US public land system. Thoroughly examine the information and data acquired. You do not have a lot of room to miss anything when that's what the law says. So if you produce a document that's readily available to everybody and that surveyor didn't examine that document or certainly doesn't have it in their possession, then it's negligence per se, and we don't need to talk about uh, negligence in, in, a, in a sense of an expert proving it. Here, here's, the, uh, here's the part, and then I'll leave ne this Nevada thing. Here you go, uh, location boundaries, uh, here you go. Report to a client the discrepancies concerning boundary lines and advise his or her client of the discrepancy and raise the doubts uh, here. And then it says provide a written report to the client concerning the discrepancies. That's that's what I was talking about. I do like yeah. the idea that a record of survey is that is is there at six six two five point seven zero zero. But if you follow the law in Nevada and maybe even use this to cite it, like this survey complies with, uh, you know, this section, you've cited a standard and you surveyed to it, presumably, and you have the evidence that you did that. So in the event that you're doing work in Nevada, you have standards that, that are there, but in the event that you're doing work on an ALTA, you can't break the Nevada statutes. Correct. And that's kind of how that works. That's super interesting for people who are around the country who don't have survey standards. Now, California, we don't have these type of technical standards. Uh, we have them in jurisdictions through the DOTs and various cities and counties and so on and so forth, but we don't actually have statutes. So uh, just yep. an observation. Right on, uh, right on page one of the standards, it basically says, you know, uh, in addition to the standards set forth here on surveyors must conduct their surveyors in accordance with acceptable jurisdictional survey requirements and standard of practice. So, yep. I mean, it's covered, covered there as well. Um, there's a, one in the chat that came to me. He's not able to unmute himself, but um, his question is what do you do when you find a undocumented monument within two tenths of the monument I sank in the ground? My solution initially is to blow up the proximity on my record of survey, probably just showing a, a detail, maybe of an unfound monument or whatever. So in that situation, what would you do? Well, um, depending on why those two monuments were in there, it comes down to measurement. And for a couple of tents, uh, I'm, I'm surely not going to set a third monument. Uh, I would I would hope that I would accept one of those monuments, one of those two monuments, most likely. And then in California, what the statute says is that uh, your record of survey will show all found monuments, all monuments found, set, reset, or removed. I might take it out. I know that's like sacrilege, but uh, I've actually removed in certain instances monuments documented them just like you said a detail showed where they were and here's the, here's the logic behind it california law allows me to do that under 876 8764 uh, information shown on record survey includes removed 8725 says that you cannot remove a monument in the state of california unless you're licensed as a surveyor so therefore i'm licensed therefore i have the authority to remove a monument now i know that freaks a lot of people out freaks me out a little bit too but let's think about this. If I have two monuments, two tenths apart, and this is for a client, two, two adjacent property owners, and they're gonna build a wall, 
how how are they okay with two monuments? Which monument are they going to build to? They don't know what a survey number is. They don't know what my license number is. They don't recognize that. And so they're going to maybe take whichever one benefits them the most. So our license is to protect the public from us. If I set two monuments, two tents or two feet apart from each other that are supposed to represent the same property corner, arguably we've damaged the public. And therefore my logic is, is to leave two monuments in the ground that represent one property corner is a damage in a situation if I know what they're gonna do with it. So I remove that monument, I place a monument or accept the second monument in this instance, I file a record of survey and say, I did have a monument, two tents, northeast 90 degrees from this monument and I removed it and it's a public protection issue I know it freaks people out now in fairness I was sued for doing that <laughs> as, an individual <laughs> and as, a company, as, as an individual and as a company uh, it, it, they tried to make it a class action because I what happened was this is a war story so I'll keep it short is we had a block and in the block, somebody made a mistake in the early nineties, did a two monument tangle, we call it, uh, came off two centerline monuments and placed a lot in this block, placed the monuments in, in, in there. Well, every sub, and they had to have known because there was a lot of monuments in that block that they didn't fit everything by about half a foot. And so nobody wanted to fix the problem because it was going to be a big survey to figure it out. So everybody kept piggybacking on this 1990 survey all the way through. And they got all the way down to the second to the last lot. That lot had, these are right on the beach in Newport Beach, just so you know. <laughs> that last lot had been in the family, it was third lot in actually, had been in the family since 1946. And there wasn't a, a survey done in 46 by a very reputable survey here in Orange County and the adjacent lot had always been empty. And then the old original house was in the, the first lot. Well, what they kept doing is they kept going record from these monuments and setting more monuments over the course of the last 30 years. And then when they got to that third to the last lot to, to, to develop it, they went in and took half a foot of what turned out to be my client's property uh, because she was the last one, you know, everybody else. And, and so, that's what happened. Well, I was able to go back in and dig down and find enough original monuments over the course of three blocks. This was all done by a, a surveyor named Jack Robb in the area. And I was able to reconstruct these monuments and this, these blocks and they were perfect. I mean, the, he was a very good surveyor. And what happened was, is in 1990, they had these old leaden tacks set in the, um, down on the peninsula in Newport Beach. They were in the concrete and somehow, some way when they, decided to pave over that. They put about a, a, I don't know, a foot lift of asphalt, you know, in 50, 40 years ago, or no, not that long ago, but a number of years ago, they shifted those well monuments over. They put well monuments in place and they were off half a foot. And so when they came off the wells, they checked, let's say they were 500 feet between them. When you measure between those two well monuments, they were 500 feet, but they had shifted half a foot. And so when they came in and put them in record because of their well monuments, city put them in they must be right and then when they started seeing these lead and tax and these things and these old they just ignored them and then people started piggybacking onto them so i resurrected this entire block and said that's where it's always been since the 20s and monumented in the 40s that's where it is now i left the monuments in where because they have some kind of rights to their monuments down there you know on the other end of the block same block because they all agree with each other, but you know, it was $400,000 worth of litigation for the property owners. It was a mess. And down there, the, the actual lot that they own is lot five of tract whatever, that lot is not where their monuments are or where their house is built. You know, the actual title of that lot. They should go in and resubdivide that half of the block. But what I did is I reset all the centerline monuments around there, documented it all and put them all back in place. And I removed the adjacent property owners monuments uh, because they were litigating half a foot and there's a lot of people looking at it. That's what happened. And uh, that was a mess. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's a war story, but that's what you do. Yeah, um, no, that's a great story, especially to go back and find all the original stuff. That's awesome. Uh, Dave's got a good point in the chat. Dave said, basically, if you find an 
uh, a monument with no identifying record, uh, make sure you check with your state to see when the recording laws basically went into effect, right? And so Oregon started uh, requiring surveys back in the mid 40s. So there are a lot of, un, uh, a lot of monuments of unknown uh, likely set by surveyors before the 40s. So yeah, good stuff. Um, Jen, I think you caught, you caught up on kind of what the record of survey is now. Yep, there you go. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Anybody, anybody else want to chime in? We'll kind of keep it to our hour and a half-ish that we normally do, but any more questions or comments? That was good. Thanks, Dave. I loved it. Uh, thank well, you. we'll definitely have you. Well, obviously you come back on next month for us again anyway, a uh, different topic, which we'll be uh, talking about RTK stuff. So that'll be another good one as well. So yeah, that's great. Thank you, everybody. Of course. Hey, hey Trent and Dave, this is Rob McMillan. Go for it, Rob. You know, we're we're trying to do the first Monday of the month with how to solve some of these problems on yeah. the FS or PS exams. Correct. You know, maybe we should target one uh, one week during the month as the war story month of, you know, with stories just like this one that Dave just told about, well, this is what we found and this is what happened and this is why it happened, you know? Yeah. And uh you know, we, those are the kind of things that that maybe we all remember because they'll haunt us in our dreams or something. You know, <laughs> that oh, we didn't we didn't shoot the foundations of the houses that have been there since the since the mid twenties or the you know early thirties, and and we established these boundaries based on some goofy proration thing. There you go. Uh, those are yeah, I definitely. I mean, sometimes those are more informative than, you know, structured uh, conversations for sure. And then uh, Jason sent me a, a private message. How about the fifth Monday of every month <laughs> for the war stories days? <laughs> yeah, if there, if there is a fifth Monday. Sure. <laughs> that's right. It may happen once or twice a year. There you go. No, that's good. That's awesome, guys. I appreciate it. Uh, lots, of lots of accolades in the uh, chat for you too, Dave. So we'll, uh, we'll, yeah, we'll see you next month. Bye. See you guys next week. Thanks, guys. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Bye. David. Yep. Bye.